Hi everyone, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm my name is Dharam Kumbhani, and I'm the chief of interventional cardiology at UT Southwestern in Dallas. And I'll be talking to you about uh, Minoka. So I don't have any um, relevant disclosures. Now you know we are very used to sort of seeing a patient presenting with sort of this classic uh, picture of chest pain, having you know a severe angiographic stenosis, and then that being treated uh, with typically with angioplasty. What gets harder is when you have somebody that sort of presents just like this, but then actually has a presentation that looks more like to the picture on the right from the get-go. So in, in other words, when they don't have any significant disease. Now, this is a fairly common uh, problem. So non-obstructive disease in patients with acute coronary syndromes is, is felt to be from some of the older studies as common as about eight to 10% in patients presenting with MI um, and you know almost a third of patients with unstable angina and with a higher prevalence in women compared with men. In a more contemporary meta-analysis, overall prevalence among patients presenting with ACS was about 6%. And interestingly, of these patients, 33% actually presented um, as a ST elevation MI. So this sort of phenomenon has been called a number of things over the years. You've heard of cardiac syndrome X, the microvascular disease, Minoka, and sort of its stable component, Inoka. So, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this Minoka component, which is MI in the absence of coronary artery disease. Now, first of all, um, it's not a benign condition. So where the mortality for um, patients with epicardial disease is around 3% at 30 days and 7% at a year, the mortality for Minoka patients is about 1% uh, at 30 days and close to 4% at a year. So certainly not a benign condition. Um, compared, uh, you know, with patients who don't have any of these problems. So there have been two scientific statements, one from the European Society and one from the American Heart Association that really sort of go into the details of what Minoka is and sort of the management strategies. And I was a co-author on this um, when this was written a couple of years ago. And so I'm going to discuss uh, many elements of this document as well. So first of all, you know, we all appreciate that what we are seeing is patients with obst obstructive atherosclerosis, but you know, just like the tip of the iceberg phenomenon, there are a number of patients who actually have many of these conditions. Again, we'll kind of go into some of these details. Now, the first aspect is how do you diagnose Minoka? So the diagnosis requires an acute MI as defined by the fourth universal definition of MI, which is typically a rise and fall in your troponin, and then you have some corroborative sign of ischemia infarction, such as ECG changes, uh, new wall motion, et cetera. They would have non-obstructive disease on um, angiography. Uh, it can be completely normal, have mild disease or less than 50%. And then there's no clear alternative explanation for, for these findings. So they don't have sepsis, they don't have pulmonary em embolism, they don't have myocarditis. So this is sort of what you need, all three of them, to diagnose Minoka. So we have this sort of uh, traffic light uh, approach to Minoka, sort of red, uh, yellow, and green. So in red, again, is if you don't have the initial things that I mentioned, the troponin rise and fall, et cetera, uh, then that's not Minoka. You've got to consider the clinical context. If it's clearly somebody who's septic, and that's also not Minoka. Um, once you sort of establish that it's not one of these things, then you come to a working diagnosis. Could this be Minoka? Then you look for non-ischemic mechanisms of Minoka. So you look for, you get an MRI, maybe you look for things like myocarditis, Takotsubos, et cetera. So those things are not Minoka and, and those can be excluded as well. And then once those have been excluded, then you come back and say, okay, this is probably Minoka. And then you may need some additional testing uh, to kind of see, you know, how do you confirm it and sort of next steps. Now, Minoka is a heterogeneous condition. There are many different epicardial, and microvascular conditions that can result in it. So things like plaque rupture, plaque erosion, in situ thrombosis or uh, embolic uh, uh, embolism, SCAD, uh, microvascular disease, vasospasm, and then supply demand mismatch. These are all different uh, conditions that result in uh, sort of this Minoka. Now, one of the underlying sort of reasons for this is an angiogram is just a luminogram. It does not tell us about the plaques in there. So you can have two segments of the same vessel that look angiographically identical, but one may have uh, evidence of positive remodeling and plaque. So as a result of that, not all plaque rupture is angiographically evident. So you can have the same pathophysiology with uh, necrotic core and plaque rupture and thrombus formation, 
but you may not see that angiographically. Now, is this common? So in the right clinical context, this may be very common. So there have been some IVA studies um, which suggest that the incidence of this may be um, as high as 30%. And interestingly, you know, this area of plaque uh, rupture, which you're kind of seeing on the right side panel here, where you have this ruptured plaque, it can actually be in a completely normal segment angiographically um, of that vessel. Now, what is also interesting is these are not your typical fibro fatty, um, uh, sorry, not your typical sort of lipid rich um, plaques. These are fibrous or fibro fatty plaques. Um, and they're not typically in areas with high plaque burden typically. So again, this is a very different um, uh, issue and sort of really requires knowledge of this to be looking for this. Plaque erosion is another uh, important component where you have a lot more smooth muscle uh, proliferation. There's no necrotic pore, and then you have the superimbus thrombus. You're unlikely to see this on IVIS, and it can also be a very common cause of ACS in young patients. Um, Ajit and others have been you know, experts in this and really feel that in the Indian context, uh, this may actually be a very important mechanism for ACS. So you would really need good OCT imaging to see this, where you would see the thrombus, you would see the luminal irregularity. You don't see any obvious plaque rupture in this frame and sort of in subsequent frames. Uh, and then you have this sort of thick endema without any uh, necrotic pore. And so these are the sort of salient features that you really need to diagnose plaque erosion. And these, these don't typically require PCI. Now, intracoronary imaging really opens our eyes to a whole host of other conditions. So SCAD is another condition that, um, you know, we would not be able to tell angiographically. As you know, SCAD um, can be uh, three different types. There's the sort of more typical, uh, you know, dissected contrast staining uh, in the false lumen type one SCAD. There is a smooth SCAD, which is type two, which is typically an intram um, uh, intramural hematoma. And then there is sort of more distal SCAD, which can look just like athero. And so, Remember, most SCAD is not going to be Minoka because you, by definition, Minoka requires less than 50% stenosis, but you can have subtle manifestations of SCAD that can look just like that. The other part of this is, you know, the coronary microcirculation is very important. You know, what we're seeing is only and andrographically is only 5% of the total coronary tree. There's a whole uh, very large network of arterioles, capillaries uh, that we're just not seeing with this, but that can be equally important in this pathophysiology. So some of the ways in which this may come into play is microembolism. So say you have plaque rupture in a normal, angiographically normal segment, then that can um, embolize downstream and cause obstruction. That can result in an MI. You have a well-known phenomenon of microvascular obstruction where you have platelet-rich thrombi that would plug the microcirculation. And then you can also have microvascular spasm, which is an imbalance between vasodilation and vasoconstriction. Now, in this context, I think the core MICA trial is very interesting. This was run out of uh, uh, Great Britain. And, uh, you know, they were INOCA patients. So they did not have myocardial infarction, but they still had sort of stable angina component uh, or uh, parallel of that. And these were all patients without angiographic disease. And then they were subject to first functional testing and then vasospasm testing. So you can have basically three different types. You can have no obstructive disease. Your invasive physiology is normal, FFR is normal. And then again, the CFR microvascular testing is very important. Um, so the value less than two is considered abnormal and that's normal. And then when you give acetylcholine, you see this intense vasospasm of the LAD that then recovers with, uh, with nitroglycerin. And so this is where you treat them with calcium channel blockers. You try to avoid any triggers like smoking and nitrates can be very helpful. On the other hand, if you have a positive microvascular dysfunction screen, your CFR is positive, IMR um, is, uh, is positive. Um, when you give, interestingly, when you give acetylcholine, you won't see epicardial spasm, but they may actually have chest pain and, and ECG changes, suggesting that they may have microvascular spasm. So this is microvascular angina. Uh, again, beta blockers may be helpful, but weight loss, uh, lifestyle modification, those things become very, very important as well. And then the last side is you have no angiographic disease, you have normal invasive physiology, no vasospasm, then those patients probably don't have cardiac chest pain and other sources would be entertained. Now in the setting of Minoka, there was a very large study uh, that was done by uh, Harmony Reynolds and uh, colleagues out of NYU. They took uh, 301 women without a clinical diagnosis or MI of which 170 had Minoka and then subject a large portion of those 
to OCT and CMR imaging. Now, again, CMR is very important for the diagnosis of uh, Minoka, uh, Minoka. So on OCT, a culprit lesion was noted in less than half of them. Uh, plaque rupture and erosion actually were um, on the lower side, uh, but intraplaque cavity and layered plaques were sort of more common um, things that they noted on OCT. On CMR, they noted infarction in 33% and regional injury in 21%, so about half of them. But about 21%, there were non-ischemic things, myocarditis, Takotsubo. So MRI actually becomes very, very helpful in distinguishing what the etiology of the chest pain and the troponin elevation is in the setting. So when you combine the two, OCT and IVIS, you have an 85% likelihood of being able to identify what the cause is, of which 64% or two thirds ends up being MI. And then the others is, you know, Takotsubo's or myocarditis, things like that. So multimodality imaging, the yield is much higher. Now, the one conundrum is if you have a positive MRI that suggests some regional wall motion, for example, regional infarct, but the OCT is normal, then you've got to think maybe it was spasm or maybe it was thromboembolism or a missed culprit lesion. Um, and so, again, just emphasizing that multimodality imaging, OCT, and cardiac MRI is really felt to be sort of the standard of care for patients with Minoka, and they provide sort of this complementary informa information that uh, you may not be able to get with one modality alone, and certainly not with angiography. Now, why is it important to phenotype, you know, what exactly is the cause of the Minoka? Is that it really drives your treatment decision. So if you have sort of your typical plaque disruption, you know, you would treat it just like any other atherosclerotic problem. You treat with uh, antiplatelets, with statins, beta blockers, et cetera. If you identify spasm, then you obviously want to avoid beta blockers and you want to treat them with calcium channel blockers and other nitrates and things like that. Microvascular dysfunction can be very hard to treat, um, but those can be treated by calcium channel blockers, beta blockers. And then there's a low role for things like renolazine and, uh, you know, evabridine also and trimetazidine, uh, which is not available in the U.S., may also have a role. And so similarly, sort of once you identify what the cause is, you can actually try to treat it accordingly. So in conclusion, Minoka is a heterogeneous syndrome. It's caused by many different pathophysiologic mechanisms. And identifying the cause in each individual patient is very important to determine what therapy will be. Multimodality imaging, as I showed you with cardiac MRI and OCT, and also provocative testing, a lot of that ends up being on the stable side, can have a high diagnostic yield depending on you know, the pretest probability that uh, this patient may have this condition. And remember, these patients deserve the same attention as patients with MI due to apicardial disease. So in 2022, it's probably not enough to just look at the angiogram and say, well, it looks normal. You had an MI, but I'm not sure what happened. So I'll end there and I'll be happy to stay. Uh, I'll be happy to, you know, look forward to some of the discussions at the end. Thank you so much.